good morning to you all. We're so glad that you guys are back in the house of the Lord for another Sunday. Can we give God an amen? amen. Hallelujah. All right, so um, we're, before we get into worship, again, we just want to welcome our new guests or people that may be visiting. And especially if you have prayer requests, no matter what it is, please meet with Pastor Ron, myself, Ed, or the other church workers or servants that work here at the church or our volunteers because we'd love to pray with you. I I'm, I'm, hope you guys saw everything you wanted to see while you were here on the Big Island. It's a lot to, to take in. Good. It's a wonderful place. Anyway, before we do that, let's uh, bow our heads in prayer as we open up in worship. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful Sunday morning, Lord. Again, for everything that you do for us, Lord. We don't have to look very far. If we're truly in a relationship with, Lord, with you, Lord, we know that. Just the breath that we breathe every morning, Father, is a blessing not to be taken for granted, Lord. And, Father, we lift the people up in Maui again, Lord, as we pray for the leadership there, that they would have wisdom, give them knowledge and insight, Lord, as they manage this horrific incident that has occurred there, Lord, loss of life and loss of property. And, Father, as we prayed earlier, Lord, I pray that you would stifle the hands of those that would use this circumstance for their own gain. And that you would strengthen the hands of those, Father, who truly are there to minister, to support, and to lift up the people of Lahaina Maui, Lord. And the island and its people itself, Lord. Father, we pray for our leadership across the nation, Lord. Across this planet, Father. For we know ultimately, Lord, you are in charge of all things. But we pray for them, Father, because that is our responsibility, Lord. So we lift them up and we lay them at your feet. Father, we pray for the worship, Lord. I pray for Brother Juan and Brother Ken, Lord. I thank you, Father, that they're here to share with us today, Lord. And I pray that this worship time would minister to our hearts, Lord, that we'd open up our ears, open up our hearts, Lord, so that we can hear your soft, still voice speak to us through your Holy Spirit, Lord. Father, we love you so much, Lord. If there's a brother or sister here hurting today, Lord, I pray, Father, that it would minister to them, that the passages that would be shared by Pastor Ron in the sermon later, Father, would speak to them directly as only you can, Lord. Holy Spirit, pour out your spirit upon this place, Lord, as we prepare it for worship. And I pray, Lord, that our worship would be a sweet-smelling aroma and a blessing to you. Pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's all rise and give praise to our God and Savior. One, two, three. I believe there is one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, yes. I believe in the crucifixion. By his blood I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection. Hallelujah, his life is best. Defeat. All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome. The King who was and lives and evermore will be in Jesus' mighty name. I believe. I believe in the hope of heaven. He's preparing a place for me, far beyond what hearts imagine. Ears have heard and eyes have seen. I believe that a day is coming. He's returning to claim his bride. 
Light the altar, keep it burning. See the Lamb who rolls the roaring light. All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was omniscient. Evermore will be in Jesus' mighty name. I believe. I believe. I believe. I will never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away? From the one who saved my life No, I will never be ashamed Of the gospel of Jesus Christ How could I ever walk away From the one who saved my life How could I ever be ashamed Of the gospel of Jesus Christ How could I ever walk away From the one who saved All praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus' mighty name. I believe, I believe. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. There is only one God, our living Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. We're waiting for your return. But, Lord, keep us busy before you come back, Lord. We thank you and honor you and praise you. We want to just honor our God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The secret in the quiet place In the stillness you are there In the secret in the quiet hour I wait only for you Cause I want you to know you more I want to know I want 
for my heart.
It's because we care. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all things. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free, oh, Jesus has sing for all that you've done for me. So good, God is awesome. Let's tell all the Lord how great He is. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship. As we lift your holy name, 
You know, when I was young, I was so koloi. Uh, I had so much food ear from my mom. But, but you know what? The Lord never took his hand off of any one of us. We want to praise you, Lord. I'm not the kolohe boy I used to be. Oh, your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness Darkest night, 
You are close like no other I know you as a father I've known you as a friend As I have lived And the goodness of God All my life you have been Thank you and honor and praise you, Lord, and give you all the glory, Lord. Pray, open our hearts to your word. Open our hearts to you, Lord. Mold us, shape us, Lord. We need you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's, let's uh, greet one another. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. We have a lot today. Uh, following the message today, we're going to have a testimony 
Um, we're streaming right now, but as soon as the message is over, I pray we're going to cut the stream off because when someone gives a testimony, uh, sometimes they don't want it to go out. It's for you. It's for the body of Christ here. Um, so please stay, listen, and you'll be encouraged in the Lord because it's really what God has done. Is the greatest miracle is a changed life, isn't it? So with that said, I want to open in prayer. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your, your truly your goodness, that your mercies are new every morning. And Lord, we look to you to speak through your word, to give me wisdom and clarity. Lord, if there's anything that I should not say, put a watchman on my lips. Lord, we need to hear from you. So speak as your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to remind you, and, and that's also the guest, that any money that goes into the offering box today is going to Maui. It's going to those that need the most. We're sending to Calvary Chapel, again, in Lahaina. And what we have decided as, as, as a board is that we're going to help support them over a long period of time because uh, they need to stay in that community and minister as they rebuild. So all the money coming goes to them, no administration cost, it goes to those that need. And sometimes we don't realize, right now there's a lot, it's the long term, but let's say that you're on a fixed income and you need a prescription and, and your part of it might be four or $500 once a month. And there are people that have been in the church from time to time and needed that. And this is where that money will go to help someone who simply doesn't have the medication they need. But I want to share something from uh, United um, with Israel. It's, it's an email I get. And Smart Aid is a group of Jewish people, some from Germany, a lot from Israel. And this is what they said about the community. We believe that the only way to come out stronger is to allow the local community to decide what is best for them. That they lead the way, they decide when and where the aid efforts must be concentrated. And that's what we're doing, is getting it to the people that are part of that community. For example, if something happened in this community here, who would best know? Not somebody far but somebody's in the community that has a heart for the community, somebody that God has placed there, and that's what we're doing. So just know all that money, and next week I'll let you know how much it is. And um, there have been other churches that are giving along that same way. Well, to kind of start and get a running um, start into our text, for those that haven't been here, um, we looked at Second Peter chapter 2, and turn to Second Peter chapter 3 why I'm talking, but we began, when we began chapter 2, we looked at the DNA of the false teachers. And then we went to look at God's judgment upon those false teachers. And then the next lesson we had is, it was, then we saw the consequences of the heresy of those false teachers. And finally, the false freedom of those false teachers. But today, we've come to chapter 3. And we also have three breaks in it this time. And the first one we're going to begin with today is the, the end time mockers. I pray you guys are not mocking. When I was a kid, I was, again, a scoffer, a mocker in some cases. But we're talking about the Word of God, and you'll see in a second. And next week, we'll look at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And when we get to it, we'll look at the end of the world in, in Second Peter from God's perspective. These things, number one, should motivate us to look around and say, God, what do you want us to do? Where would you have us go? And oftentimes that just begins right in our own communities. Remember the book of Acts? On the day of Pentecost, it started there in Jerusalem, then the Samaria, and then the outermost parts of the earth guess what? You're living in the most outer parts of the earth, especially when you're out in the middle of the ocean so far away from everything. Well, again, we're going to look at this and we're going to focus, the thing that we want to focus on first is really the saint's reality. 
And, and whether you or I like it or not, in these end times, false teaching is out there and it's not going to leave. You can get angry all you want. The best thing you can do is pray and be a Berean. Examine the scripture and see if it's so, especially if you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, any place on the internet. There are so many false teachers out. We are, as we've talked about, in a time of apostasy, of falling away from that truth. Simply what we have is false teachers that do not heed the very word of God. Now, we can point the fingers at them. They're not heeding. They're not paying attention. But let's make it personal. What about you? Are you heeding the word of God? When God speaks to you, how do you act? How do you respond? It's so easy to point the finger at someone else. But we may not be doing what they're doing, but if we're not doing what God has called us to do, we're just as guilty in another way. Well, Peter describes these false teachers and their followers in, in, in chapter, again, 3 and verse 3 is last day's mockers. And in the King James, again, in chapter 3, verse 5, it says this, for they are willingly are ignorant you know, ignorant, they choose not to respond. They choose not to be obedient. They choose to push it away. And I gave a quote last week, no one is so blind as he who shuts his eyes to the truth. And that's what they do. They have another agenda. And they want to fleece those people. It's all about them. We talked about it. But what they do is they go on mocking the truth. These, and we'll talk about them. They just don't want to hear the truth. The truth that you and I know that will set a person free. Hasn't the truth changed your life radically? Give us a hope and a reason to live. Knowing that when our loved ones, if they close their eyes in this world, that as believers we know that we'll see them face to face with Jesus. What a wonderful thought, isn't that? What a wonderful blessing. Well, there's something that we see in verse 1 I want to call your attention to, and there must be a revival. It says, I am writing to you in which I am stirring up a sincere mind. That idea of stirring is, a, is to waken, to rouse you out of your sleep, a spiritual sleep, a spiritual slumber. The church... It's full of apathy if they're listening to false teachers. Apathy meaning in this sense that if, if you know that God is coming again, that you're just living as the world's going to go on for another thousand years. I've known people say, oh, he's not coming back for 500 years. And my heart grieves. The reality, you look around and you see the world is getting worse and worse and more evil. The people are getting more angry, except for the believers. See, they're less angry, less reactive. It's a process. Well, this analogy of, of sleep, it, it, it speaks of, a, again, this sense of a spiritual apathy. And the term wake is always, in, in a spiritual sense, quickened with revival. We need a spiritual awakening. When Calvary Chapel started, if you saw that movie that we showed here, again about, again, Greg Laurie's life, there was a spiritual awakening. And when a person's born again, there's a spiritual awakening, they come alive. But much of the church is, is, is sleepy. They're like the church of Laodicea in many ways. They, they're sure that they're saved. They're worried about what's in their pockets and things and life and pulling away. But they're blind. They don't see. And they need to be woke up. Now you turn around and say, yes, the world needs a revival. Are we agreeing on that? You look at the government. But do you know who needs revival? Us. It really begins in our heart to return to that first love, like the church of Ephesus, if you remember. How serious are we taking God's word when he speaks to our hearts? 
This is so important. So we can't be pointing fingers at anyone else. It really starts here with me, with you individually. Romans 13, 11 says this, Do this knowing that the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. Isn't that what we, we want our family and friends to be awakened we want them to go with us. We want them to know the God that we know. We want them to know the goodness of God. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6 on the screen, you'll see, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. See this idea of sleep. They need to be awakened. The world is, a, is oblivious to what is happening around them. Many believers are oblivious, so we call them oftentimes carnal Christians fleshly Christians are consumed with things around them. And then in Ephesians 5.14, it says this, for this reason, it says, awake sleeper, arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Now, when you're out in the community, any place you're going, don't you automatically recognize Christians? There's something different about them and there is a unity no matter what church they go to, if they've been born again. Because you know they have the joy of the Lord. It doesn't even matter whether they speak the same language. You just recognize there's something different. So, so often before I became a believer, I would, I would see people that were Christians around me, and, and I, I had enough of kind of Christendom, knowing what the Word said, but not obedient. And I go, I, I, I bet they're Christians. I don't want to ask what people thought about me because I wasn't a Christian at that time. But we need to let that light shine. The church, again, this is very important, has never experienced such an indifference towards spiritual matters as you see today. The church is in a, a spiritual apathy. Now, when I talk about the church, that's it's all the different denominations. Those who trust in Jesus Christ, that believe in the Bible, at least they think they trust in Jesus Christ. But they're asleep. They punch their card for salvation. They've been baptized. But they're really not trusting and resting in Jesus Christ. Again, Leonard Ravenhill said this about the tragedy of today. Hell is burning while the church sleeps. The enemy is working overtime while the church is sleeping. Well, let me take you to Matthew 13, verse 25, and it's from the parable of the sower, and he says this, but while the men were sleeping, their enemy came and sowed the tares among the wheat and went away. The wheat and tares grow side by side. Fact is, you can't tell the difference until the time of the harvest. Don't look around. You can't tell the difference. Just make sure your calling is sure that you know that when you close your eyes in this life, that you will open your eyes and behold the beauty of the Lord. So again, what the church really needs is another great awakening and beginning in our life. That, that when you and I go into the community, that Jesus, the, the love of Jesus just oozes out of our lives. Or as Brian prayed, when we were praying in the other room, I believe it was, and I'm going to use different words, but that we bring the fragrance of Jesus to a lost world. That you and I then are ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within us. There must be righteousness as well. Also in verse 1, I'm stirring up your sincere mind. Sincere speaks of a, a pure mind. In fact, let me... Again, read, and you'll see it on the screen, Titus 1.15, to the pure all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. We have to have this pure, clean conscience. In Revelation 2.5, it says, Therefore, remember from where you've fallen and repent and do the deeds at first, or else I'm coming to you and remove the lampstand out of your place unless you repent. Now, that can apply to us in, in, in a way, too, that if we are not passionate about our love for God, we can lose our influence in this community. 
What kind of influence do we have? How do unbelievers look? Oh, yes, there's going to be mockers. We'll talk about it in a second. But, but do they see there's something different about us? We have to trust God because he's the one that will bring, again, the harvest. John 15, 3 says, you are clean already because of the word I've spoken to you. See, we are born again by the word of God. It cleanses us and washes it. You're being washed by the water of the word every time that you read the word of God. And this is so important to think about, that, that God wants us to be holy as he's holy. Now, again, God intends that his people be pure and holy and set apart for comfort. No, it doesn't say that. Set apart for him a vessel of honor, his witness. When he's speaking in the book of Acts, again, that they were to be witnesses, it wasn't so much about knocking on doors and going out and telling everybody as their lives are a testimony. There must be a God. When people see you, do they know there must be a God? I know that guy's past. They see the change. They've seen the kindness. There's something different. And it means in every place in our lives from the telephone company, if they mess your bill up, to people at Walmart, to Safeway, when they're fighting in the aisles, how do we handle things? You know, why not be wrong sometimes and be a witness for Jesus? It's not so important to have all of our rights. Again, the word for pure comes from a compound word. It means to be tested and judged by light. It's interesting. In, in ancient times, it, it, it would be mean sincere or Sarah. It, it would mean without wax, like if they fired a pot and there was a crack in it, they would fill it with wax, deceitful. Our lives are to be sincere and pure and not to be hypocrites. Is anyone hypocritical here in some way? Let's try one more time. Is anyone? <laughs> we need to be aware that we all have struggles in our lives. The work is not finished, it's not done. And when we find ourselves in that place being hypocritical, we need to confess and repent and pray to God, God, grant me the grace to change it, to see my actions and how others receive me. Because you may even sometimes have a pure heart and be misunderstood. Anyone ever been misunderstood? Don't even hold your hands up. But you know what I mean, that could I have done anything different? Could I said it another way? And we need to make right. You see, God wants us to be pure that we're like Christ Jesus. Again, the same word is translated in Philippians. Philippians 1.10, so that you may prove the things that are excellent in order to notice, be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ Jesus. If you got a regular Bible underline that apart again sincere and blameless until the day of Christ the day of Christ is not the day of the Lord the day of Christ is when you and I that is if we're still here be caught up in the rapture that he began a good work he will complete it he will keep us until the day he will finish the work in you and me and you'll never say anything that will ever hurt anybody and be misunderstood or misrepresent God in any way. That's a hard one. When we're living, walking in a hypocritical way, this is important to understand, we are misrepresenting God when we call ourselves Christians. And all of us do that at some point, and that's why we need to confess and repent. And there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Aren't you thankful for that? Because God knows your heart that, gosh, God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Father, change my heart. Cleanse me from the inside out. So Christians should be sincere, tested by the light, the light of what? The light of God's word. He's given us a conscience, a, a moral conscience. And when we're reading, the Holy Spirit convicts us and says, you know, Ron, this is what you need to change in your life. 
I know you want to do it, but, but I want you to see. This is where I'm going to take you to. And I love that. Because truthfully, sometimes, I know you're probably sick of me, but I'm sick of myself too. I want to change. I want to be more like him each day. Peter is telling um, us that really what we need is not to be mixed with the world, but sincere. Having this pure mind and standing the, the test of faith. Also in verse 1, we see this thought there. There must be remembrance. Oh, I want to check you guys out here. How many have a problem with memory? <laughs> And not, you know, it's when you get older. Some of the young ones tell me, i got a problem with memory too. But there's certain things that we really need to focus upon. We need to hide this word in our hearts that we don't sin against him. Well, again, notice the great emphasis in, in really in this one part here. Uh, in Second Peter, in verse 12 and 13 and 15, and we'll really get these next week, but I wanted to bring them out now. And we're going to see the idea of remind and remembrance and, and calling things to mind. You know, when you get older, you remember the things way years ago that you don't even want to remember. And five minutes ago, you can't remember what the conversation is. But again, when I saw my grandmother before she passed away and I become a believer, she had dementia. I didn't want my kids to remember her in that situation. But when I told her, Grandma, and we went and visited her, and, and uh, she was in another state, I became a Christian for 15 minutes. I had the grandmother that I always knew. Christ just gave her back for 15 minutes so my kids would know her. I'll never forget his goodness and how much that meant to me. And he's always there. The problem is we're not always, we're off someplace else. But he's tagging along, he's following, and all we need to do is turn to him. So in this remembrance, we need to be careful. And even as God's people, because it's so easy to forget and lose sight of the author and finisher of our faith. It happens just like that. You start off in the Word, and, and, you, and somebody stops right in front of you, almost run into them, and uh, you're no longer in the Spirit, but in the flesh. But I've known people that have just, it doesn't phase them anymore. I don't want to be like that. And I think you want to be like, there's such a peace in your heart. Because you don't know what has happened to them up there, or why that's happening. Again, so we need to be careful and, and, and concerned because the witness, the gospel that you and I are spreading, it begins with our actions, our attitudes. Then when we speak that truth, they're more likely to listen to that. Well, first we see the word remember it simply means to uh, recollect of what we've already heard. You can tell me, I'm going to tell you, guess you tell me your name today, but in five minutes I'll forget it. I have to repeat it several times. I have to write it down. You know that. You probably do that. Uh, uh, I have a bullet list. If I go to the store, I make sure I get everything on the list. Well, that's what we need to do with God's Word, too. Whether it's on our phones or whether it's in a piece of paper. Second, we need to be mindful, able to call things back and pray, God, do you know that I'm struggling with this? You can take a lot of things away, but don't take my memory away. God has brought a lot of things back to me simply because I pray and I seek him. And that begins as we're, again, seeking him, fixing our eyes on the author, finisher of our faith. And as we're seeking him, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, first, God just has a natural way of giving you the right words, the right thoughts at the right time. But if you're seeking the flesh, guess what? You don't even want to think about the Word of God, do you? Well, Romans, uh, again, Romans 8, verse 5 says, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds upon the things of the flesh, and those according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And what it's talking about, first of all, is again, unbelievers and believers. That's the contrast. They think differently. Why are you angry? They're blinded by the God of this world. They need Jesus. 
Second, it's talking about, again, carnal believers and believers. There are people within the body of Christ that truly believe in Jesus Christ to save them. They're looking for him to come back, but they're still living in their fleshly ways. I hate to say that. I hate to use the term carnal Christians. But it means they're seeking after their fleshly desires. And what this verse is teaching is those who, whose mind is on the things of the flesh, they're controlled, directed by their fallen nature. The old man is described. Their thoughts, their affections on their own selfish interests. Anyone selfish here? Yeah, we all struggle with that. And so we have to be aware of that. Here's this battle that's continually going on in you and me. Because if we're not aware of it and not, again, beginning to focus on Christ, then what we're going to do is continually seek our own gratification and live for self. After all, the world's telling you it's all about you. You can have it your way. Well, the contrast is those who walk in the Spirit. See, they set their minds upon the Word of God, not just the Word and reading it here, but the living Word of God. Jesus is living, and He is the Word of God, and you can read that in, in John uh, verse 1 and, and through 3, the Gospel of John. They're concerned about, really, His will. His will for their life. See, if you're not thinking about what, what is His will for your life, then you know if you're not in the Spirit you're focused on the flesh. I know that's not what you want to hear, but it's the truth. It's either, you're either in one camp or the other. Christians are known to, to, for the older ones you understand, about playing the hokey pokey. One foot in, shake it all around, and then we come back. And so we have to be careful. The Christian, the one who's in the Spirit, has different priorities, and his priorities are the principles of God, and they're important to him. What does God say? I kind of dislike it in a, a Bible study when people say, uh, what does this passage mean to you? Or what does it mean to you? I, I don't care. I, I don't want to be rude what it means to you. What did it mean to God? Why did God give it to us? Because sometimes we take things out of context and miss really the heart of God. In verse 2, notice again with me, I want to call your attention to the word, two words, holy prophets. And this is important. It, it draws a contrast to these, what would be holy prophets that should have been, to really the false teachers and the false prophets. There's many false teachers out there and false prophets. One of the greatest signs is when they come up to you and say, I'm a prophet, run. False teachers don't say they're false teachers because they want your money or whatever they want. But there is always a contrast. You're either in the spirit, you're in the flesh. You're either walking with God or you're not walking with God. Again, in verse 2, we see the commandment of us and the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter's speaking here about the word of God and he's drawing our attention to the truth. Boy, that's something we should jump on, the truth. What is the truth of God's word? He's calling the believers again, as I already mentioned, to, to wake up to the truth of God's word. This is our plumb line, the word of God. And if you're not plumbing your life, coming up to it, you're either in the flesh or you're not even a believer. Examine yourselves and see if you're of the faith. Now, the problem is we're, we're living, again, in, in uncertain times, and apostasy is everywhere around us. You cannot avoid it. You cannot turn on the TV. You can't turn on the radio. You can't turn on without apostasy being there, telling us there's a, a total different lifestyle. And the truth is under attack. The wickedness is rapid. Mockers and scoffers, and those words are interchangeable in the context of this passage. They're bold and they speak out and they lash out all the time. We need to hold to the timeless word of God. Yesterday we did an outreach with the homeless and, and there was one person and everyone else was happy, but this one person just come down and just lashed out. I want nothing from you. I didn't want to hear from you. And it was this nastiness and, and bitterness. And I said, I'm sorry, that isn't what it 
meant or what I meant. And they wanted to argue. They wanted to mock. And the best thing you can do is just kind of step away. Don't throw your pearls before the swine. Because everyone is watching how you handle that situation. Do you handle it in love and kindness and tenderness? Do we understand that something else is going in on in their life or something has happened to life to bring them to that point where's the compassion and sometimes we just have to step away now hebrews 4 12 i'm sure you know it for the word of god is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword piercing as far as the division of the soul and the spirit both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of your heart what we do as christians we put ourselves under the word and when you put yourselves under the word, the word is, is working in you. It's, it's chiseling away. It's cleansing and washing and changing the way that, that we think. And this is the only way that we can follow the Lord and walk in the spirit. Well, I want to take you to 2 Timothy 3, verse 13 through 17. And notice what it says, but evil men apostors will proceed from bad to worse. That's what we see with the mockers, the end times, the apostasy, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, he's talking to the believer, continue in the things that you've learned, become convinced of, and knowing from where you have learned them. And from a childhood, and this is speaking about Timothy, you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So Timothy was taught by his parents, or I should say his mother and grandmother. You can follow that up later. What an influence that as mothers and grandmothers that we can have on our kids. You do care about their future. You do care about seeing them in heaven, don't you? This is the pattern we follow. But he goes on, and this is the real punchline, the next two verses, is all scriptures inspired by God Notice it's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness so the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. To simplify it, Warren Worsby put it this way, it tells us what's right, what's wrong, how to get right, and how to stay right. This book, the Bible, will do that in your life if you put yourself under that word of God. Now, there's Psalm 119.9 It says this, How can a young man keep his way pure by keeping according to the word? Uh, we used to do a song in the church we're at. How can a young man keep his way pure? By taking heed to the word of God. We used to sing it. It was one of our worship songs. What a powerful song and reminder. When you can take scripture and put it to music and a reminder what God's saying. Well, again... If we want a pure mind, we must be willing to spend time in the pure Word of God, the timeless Word of God. And then verse 3, we see really the scoffer's ridicule or the mocker's ridicule. And know this first of all, that the last in the last days mockers, they're coming. It's a fact. And again, back in chapter 2, Peter dealt with the, the awful judgment and waited for the unbeliever as well as the emphasis upon the false teacher, the false prophets. But Peter here prefaces his warning with these words again. Know this first of all, that in the last days will come with their mocking and notice following after their own lust. He is warning them that they will not only reject the message, but some will even make a sport of ridiculing the message. Years ago, when my daughter was young, we did a, um, a survey for life. And the series of questions in the end, it would say, uh, would you like to know you can go to heaven? And, and if they answer that, we could go ahead and, and share that. And, and my daughter was sharing with this lady, and she said, I'd like to, but she didn't understand the gospel. She wasn't ready. I don't know. And my daughter, who was about 13 years old, was getting angry with the lady. We don't get angry with people when they don't understand. There's a time. There's a place. One person sows the seed. Another person waters the seed. God is the one that brings the harvest. And sometimes like that, and I've done this in my own life, I've had to learn the hard way. Anyone else ever have to learn the hard way? Notice I put two hands up. And, and you know, and, and sometimes we, we blow it. But I love these two words, but God. Don't you like that? We make a mess, but God. 
We made a mess of our life, but God comes in and cleanses us from the inside out. Well, he's warning them that they'll not only reject the message, he defines them as mockers. And throughout the Bible, mockers are those who ridicule and mock the things of God. And this is important. And to, to mock means to make a, a sport of something uh, in, in contempt, to speak scornful, jeering at them. Again, Proverbs 21, verse 24, tells us something about these mockers or scoffers. They're proud, haughty scoffers are his names who act in insolent pride. So they're proud, they're haughty, they're arrogant. Don't throw your pearls before the swine. In a loving way, apologize. If there's a way you apologize, step away. Just step back. Let them make the fool of themselves and pray for them. Pray that God would open up the eyes of their heart. So the mockers are prideful and they hate the truth. Now, as a believer, the, the the opposite is they hate the truth. We should love the truth because we know what the truth does. It sets us free. They boil and rage over the truth, and they'll do anything to discredit it. So when you, you want to think, they're ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within, I'm going to give them apologetics 101. No. They're not going to listen. And if they're not going to listen... There's only one thing you can do. Give them one little verse. Do we all know John 3.16? You know, I don't know, but I know John 3.16. You quote it to them and you walk off in love. And as they're yelling and screaming at you, they're the ones that are going to make fools of themselves. And when they see that when Christians act that way, they're, they're going to recognize there's something different. Why do they have peace? They're going to recognize the anger and bitterness in them. Solomon warned us also in Proverbs 9, verse 7 through 8, he who corrects a scoffer gets dishonor for himself, and he who reproves a wicked man gets insults for himself. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. See, there are some that you can speak to that, that really want to, and when you go to them, especially if they've given you permission, hey, brother, hey, sister, you're off base here. Did you realize how that came out? And they're going to be happy. But a scoffer, they just want to argue and fight. They love drama. They love drama. And I hope you don't love drama. The older I get, the more I want to get away from any, any situations of drama. I'm just tired of it. Because nothing good comes out of drama. Again, Proverbs 13.1, a wise son accepts his father's discipline, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. So a mocker refuses correction and help. There's nothing you can do. And again, Paul tells us to expect this opposition. I've been sharing with people, and, and, and a mocker comes in, and they just start coming on. Now, I know there's a man and uh, Ray Comfort. Now, Ray Comfort has this gift of he, he likes the mockers because what he can do, he, he's given this certain grace to bring them into a conversation. Everyone is watching how calmly he handles this. And he handles, but you know, 99 and 9 tenths of the rest of us are not given that gift. So don't think you're Ray Comfort and go out there. And we are not the Messiah. We're simply the light unto this world, and it's a reflection of the light of Jesus when we've been in his presence. Remember, we're not to go out and save the world. His job is to save the world. The Holy Spirit's the one who convicts them of their sin and need for righteousness. We're just to sow the seed of God. And the one of the ways is our actions, our attitudes, and then the Word of God. Again, notice the scoffer's conduct. And in the King James, it uses the word following in verse 3. And it or King James uses walking, and then in the New American Standard, he uses following. They're either following or walking after their own lusts, which speaks of a, a lifestyle, a habitual lifestyle, the way they live. For us, we're pilgrims. This place is not our home. Our home is in heaven. 
But when it's talking about here, it's talking about settlers, those who dwell here. When you get to the book of Revelation, it talks about earth dwellers, those that are so dwelling in this, so rooted in this world. This world is not my home. What does it really offer me in light of eternity? This is so important. Because all this light is going to disappear like vapor, James talks about. Again, Peter points out the root of their mocking, as we just spoke about, is their, their own lust, their own self sinful desires. You know what sinful desires are. Because the enemy is always reminding you of those desires in your heart, remind you when you were young or whatever. You know, old people struggle just as much as young people. And we have to trust in Jesus Christ. Notice what it says in John, Gospel of John 3, verse 19 on the screen. This is the judgment that light has come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds are evil. And if you're still liking the darkness, seeking those things that, speaking of evil, it's time to do a check. Where are you at with Jesus Christ? Because we want to be in the light. We want to be walking with him, not walking after our own lust. See, the world doesn't want a restraint. Don't tell me I can't do that. Even in church, people come in. In some churches, and, and it, we're not that way, but they say, I can't have my kids in church. And they want to argue and fight, and they don't want to understand, well, we have a special class for the kids. And that's something the family should choose. But people argue over the, I want it my way. And they just go on and on, and you know, and you have those struggles probably in yourself. Romans 1.24, therefore God gave them over to the lust of their hearts and impurity so that their bodies would be dis dishonored among them. And this is when you know, a person comes to that point in no return, when they're just living for the lust. God's going to turn them over to a depraved mind, a mind that does not work. People make their own choices. Choose life or death. That's your choice. Hebrews 11, 25 says, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with, with the people of God than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. This is talking about Moses when he was again, and, and they wanted him to be the, the son of Pharaoh, and he refused. His mom had taught him young before he went over and went back, and he was living there and learned all the things of Egypt. He says, no, no, I want to be with the Lord, God's people. Well, you should be excited when you come here. I, I think you are because yeah, okay. we, our greeting time can get carried away, doesn't it? So happy to see one another in the Lord, isn't it? And we should want to be with the people of God because we can be encouraged by them, challenged by them, even tested by them. We could be porcupines, all of us sometimes, and poke one another. We learn how to deal with one another in a gracious, loving, forgiving way. Well, in verse 4, we see a, another thought there, uh, the scoffer's contempt and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Notice their arrogant attack upon the word of God. How do you recognize them? They're attacking the word of God. It's the word of men. It's lies. Jesus really didn't say that. And they put themselves over the authority. They say, where is the promise of his coming? They attack the doctrine of the second coming. Is Jesus Christ coming again? I hope you don't set dates. You might say, my birthday's coming. That'd be a good day to come. You know, but, but we can't set dates. But what we need to do is be ready today. If he would call us today, amen? And, and, and looking for him, and by the way, uh, this may seem funny. I shared it with a group, I think, on Wednesday or Wednesday morning study. And if they don't hear the whole thing, you're going to miss it. I'm not looking for the rapture. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. And, and we really sometimes need to rephrase that. We're looking for him coming. 
Can you imagine what it was like for Stephen when he was being stoned? He looked up in the heavens and saw the heavens open up and he saw Jesus Christ with open arms. I'm looking for him. Sometimes when we talk about the rapture, it's escape theory to get out of here. I want to go be with Jesus. I want to see everything he has that he intended for us in the first, in the very beginning. And, and everyone that's hurting and suffering, no more pain, no more evil. That's what I'm looking for. And I know you are too. And I just wanted to kind of share that thought to get it back upon Jesus. Because really it's all about Jesus, what he's done for us, what he's still going to do. And I want to be there when he comes. Well, anyways, there's a great hatred for the Bible in our day, and those attack um, focus foremost on discrediting the Word of God. It's right from the very beginning. Uh, we have the, we've had that really is knowing that the devil or Satan is the father of lies. Do you remember what, again, Satan said to Adam and Eve in the garden back in Genesis 3, and that's not on the screen, it's just a point I'm making, um, Indeed, hath God said, questioning what God said. And then the men in Malachi's day, where is the God of justice? These were supposed to be believers. David's enemies, where is your God? That was in Psalm 42. And then Jeremiah says, where is the word of the Lord? The implication is that God's word can't be trusted. Well, God is faithful, isn't he? There are times when I'm going through, and I'm sure you're going through things, and you realize that certain verses really stand out to you. Boy, now it takes meaning because I'm going through this. I can understand why this scripture was said. I can understand why it was written. Well, they say there's no hope for a Christian. There's no heaven, there's no hell, and there's no God. They can say all they want fact is God is real he's living and he's coming again soon John 8 44 says this you are your father the devil and you know to do the desires of your father he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him and whenever he speaks a lie he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies now first of all I just want to comment one thing there is no place for lying for the Christian. Remember, Satan's the follow, follower of, uh, not a follower, he's a liar from the beginning. And so if you lie, you're kind of giving your allegiance to the devil. And then 1 John 3, 8 says this, the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning, and the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Again, as a child of God, we, we need to know what the Word of God says. The world will try and distract us from that. In Psalm 119.11, it says, Thy word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I know a lot of people can quote exactly verses and chapters and, and, and everything. And that's good. But do they have it in their heart? If it's written on the tablets of their heart, they will walk it out. They'll see the word, and then when they speak the word, it makes more sense. Don't let scoffers cast doubt upon the word of God. It is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. In verse 5, I'm reading the King James in this first part here. Um, it says, again, for this, they're willingly ignorant. He is Here's giving us the simple fact. They're willingly ignorant. They're, they're, it's not that they're not informed. In fact, a lot of mockers have read the word and refuse to believe it, and they use it to mock people with. They purposely have shut their eyes to the truth, the truth that would set them free. As I, I said earlier, no one is so blind as he who shuts his eyes to the truth. Sometimes I've heard people Christians say, that isn't what that means. I don't believe that. And they've never even studied, never looked at it. God told me that. And it contradicts the very nature of God. 
And somehow, either they're not a believer, I don't know, or they're buying the lie of the devil. You know the devil puts thoughts in your head? Anyone experience that ever? Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and you have to learn to discern what is of God and what is not of God. The scoffers hate, again, the biblical account of creation. And this is what it's talking about again in this passage as we go on. Look with me again in 2 Peter 3, 5, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Now, Again, I mentioned last week there was a guy that I knew that he used to say the deeper things of God are speaking things in existence. So he took passages like this just to build upon that, that we're supposed to speak things into existence. Well, this is just telling us simply that mockers, again, don't choose not to understand the Word of God or believe the Word of God. We don't speak things into existence. We don't have faith in our faith. We have faith in Jesus Christ, the faithful one. This is one of the reasons they work so hard to kick the Bible out of schools. They refuse to accept what the Bible says. And they're working even harder to keep it out of schools. Sadly, the theory of evolution has infiltrated Again, the schools, they've hijacked the education, produced, again, a generation of fools, saturated their land with humanistic culture. But let me stop for a second. Don't be angry at them. Because if you're not teaching and reading the Word of God to your kids, there's a problem right there. A lot of parents have expected the schools to teach them. Teach them the morals and everything, but they're not even assuming that responsibility in their own home as it teaches in Deuteronomy chapter 6. About when you walk with them, when they lay down, the responsibility starts here. They're blinded by the God of this world. We need to pray that God would open up their eyes, stand for the truth, yes, but in a loving way. Romans chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, I'm sure you know it, professing to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image, a form of corruptible man, and the birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures, professing to be wise. They're always talking down, arrogant, finding fault, but they refuse to Look around, because God's revealed himself in all of creation. The Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. Just look out on a clear night, how amazing it is. When I come down the hill and I look at the ocean, every, every day when I come down the hill, I go, God, it's amazing you put me here. It's amazing that you spoke all this into existence. And if I'm amazed over this, what is heaven going to be like? My gosh. Well, they reject the fact of the Creator while all along they worship the creation. They worship the creation instead of the Creator. It's kind of like with the gifts of the Spirit. Some people are worshiping the gift instead of the giver and missing the purpose of the gifts to edify and build up one another. In Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and we can get caught up in creation. I'm not teaching that today, but you know where the real problem begins? In the beginning, God. They're really trying to explain God away. They don't want to deal with God. If God is there, then they're going to be accountable for their actions and their words. If people can accept the fact in the beginning, God, that everything else falls in place. Creation is something that God has done. Again, that word created in Genesis 1, 1 is bara. It means to create out of nothing. He just simply spoke it into existence. How amazing is that? A Colossians goes on, Colossians 1, verse 15 and 17. For he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. For by him all, again, all things were created, both in heavens and earth, invisible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. In him all things hold together. Who's it talking about? It's talking about Jesus Christ. He is before all things. He is preeminent. He's the one that created the heavens and the earth. God the Son. 
And then in John 1, as I mentioned earlier, verses 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, notice, and He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That's why we worship Jesus. He is the author of everything in this life. And then in Hebrews 11, 3, it says, By faith we understand the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what we seen was not made out of things which were visible. Notice again that they choose to be ignorant over God's day of judgment in Noah. Verse 6, Though or through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Noah, Noah had scoffers and mockers, and they scorned. They mocked 120 years. They didn't give up, did they? Mockers don't give up. And what's amazing is God extended his mercy 120 years. I look at my life. I didn't get saved till late in life. I'm so thankful that God was patient and long-suffering. Anyone else thankful for his patience and long-suffering? I just didn't get it. Well, let me rephrase. I didn't want to get it because I wanted to be like the world. But God, patient, long-suffering, opened the eyes of our hearts up. Again, in 1 Peter 3.20, when the patience of God kept waiting for the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the flood. Those who wait upon the Lord will be kept and saved. And they were brought through that destruction. Look with me in verse 7, our final verse here. Notice what it says, but by the word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire and kept for the day of judgment and destruction. Notice of the ungodly. Ungodly are everything that God is not. They're against God. Everything that God stands for. What a warning. Under the inspiration of the, the Spirit of God, Peter warns that the heavens and the earth that we now see as we know it are being kept for that day of destruction. There is, no matter what anyone says, you cannot change it. It's just going to happen. God said it and will be kept by it. Now, the world exists today because God created it. And it's actually, the again, Colossians we read, it's kept by him. He's, he's keeping that, and that's important to understand. Now, Colossians 1.17, he is before all things, and him all things hold together by his very word. And that's so important to understand. Now, Peter makes it clear that same word that brought creation into existence, that same word brought the worldwide flood in Noah's time and the destruction, and that same word brings the judgment in the last days. We're going to see that at the end of 2 Peter 3. But here in John 12, 48, he who rejects me does not receive my saying, has, has one who judges him, and the word I spoke is what will judge him in the last day. People will be judged by the word of God. Judged by the knowledge that God has given you. He's revealed himself in creation. Your family and friends that don't know the Lord, God has put you around them to be a light, a witness, and testimony. But they have to choose life or death. And that's important for you. Have you chosen life? Have you chosen death? What is it? You have to choose. Now I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask a brother, Michael Rodriguez, to come up afterwards, and he's going to give a brief testimony of his life. Father, thank you again for all that you've done, all that you will do, because you're a good God. You have been faithful you have blessed us richly. And Lord, what we ask today as we leave this place later, Lord, make us a blessing to this community. Make us a blessing to those that don't even know you. That Make us the witnesses that you talked about in the book of Acts. That when people see us, they know there must be a God. 
Father, help us that our actions, our attitudes, our words will not deny who you are or misrepresent you in any way. In Jesus' name, amen. Michael, would you come up?